And I'm going to get started. Uh, so we finished here. Um, we talked about what uh, n-type semiconductor was, what a p-type semiconductor was, and we said if we put them together, um, so that the n and p-type sections are adjacent, that's equivalent uh, to this structure, which is a diode. And the importance of the diode in the circuit, sim circuit symbol is that if we apply a voltage across the diode with this polarity, that means current wants to flow in that direction, and the diode will allow this current to flow. If I flipped around the voltage and I tried to make current flow the other way, that doesn't go with the way that the arrow of the diode circuit symbol is pointing, so it's not going to allow current to flow that way. Okay, so that's what it does. Um, but why does it do that? So we're going to, again, look at some physics of what's going on once we put these two types of semiconductor materials together. Um, again, it's, it's just a difference in um, in those those doping atoms that are adding or subtracting those free electrons away, it can be the same material. So this can be this this n-type semiconductor can be n-type silicon, and this p-type semiconductor can be p-type silicon. So it's all silicon, um, but they just have those those different amounts of, of free electrons. Okay, so if we put these these two materials together. I'm keeping um, blue still as, as the n-type side and this, this pinkish color still as the p-type side. Uh, this is what is happening. So we're, let's plot a concentration on the y-axis and the x-axis is just physical position. So either in the n-type side or in the p-type side. Okay, so in the n-type side, without the, the p-type material there, I have a lot of those electrons. And I don't have very many holes because I, I doped the material, so I had a lot of extra electrons. Okay, you have the opposite case on the p-type side. And when I bring them together, what happens is that um, the electrons that are going to say on the n-type side, they're going to look over at the p-type side and say, well, there's not very many electrons there, so I want to diffuse over. It's just the property of diffusion. Go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Same thing for the holes from the p-type side. They're going to look at the n-type side and say, okay, there's not very many holes on the n-type side, so I'm going to start diffusing over to the n-type side. So that means I will have electrons going from the n-type side to the p-type side, and I have holes going from the p-type side to the n-type side. So that's a movement of charge, and that's our definition of current, just the movement of charge. So that means there should be some current uh, that's coming out of this. So if I have negative charges, which are electrons, moving from left to right, and I have positive charges, which are the holes moving from right to left, then my current is going to go from right to left. right? Because my, my current direction will be in the same direction as the movement of positive charge in the opposite direction of the movement of negative charge. So even though my negative charge is moving in a different direction from my positive charge, my current's all moving in the same direction. So that means the result of this diffusion 
um, the electron diffusion and the hole diffusion means I have this diffusion current down, labeled down here. Uh, I sub DIFF for diffusion. Okay, so that's what happens when we when the two materials are in contact. Um, we have diffusion just due to the, the different concentrations, and that creates a diffusion current. Um, because I have these, these movement of the charge carriers, something also happens where we set up something uh, called a depletion region. So uh, it's sort of, if we think about, uh, you can think about the people in this classroom as the charges. Okay, so if I, we don't have room in this classroom, but if, if half of these seats were empty, like all the seats in the front of the class were empty, and everyone is sitting at the back, uh, then that would set up the conditions for diffusion, right? There'd be a large concentration at the back, back of the class, a uh, very low concentration at the front of the class. So assuming you were a charged particle, you would then want to move down to the front of the class. Um, there's a slight gradient towards the back, uh, probably because you're not a charged particle. There's maybe a potential barrier for you to come towards the front. But assuming that um, you're just a particle in this example, you would want to, to move to even it out. And when you move from, from your seat in the back to the front, you're leaving behind uh, the empty seat or your absence. Okay, so that's what happens when we, when we form the depletion region. So we initially will start off with our n-type material with all these electrons. That's these uh, negative signs here. And the p-type material with all the extra holes, the positive charges. And then they start diffusing. Okay, so the electrons are diffusing to the p-type side. And the holes are diffusing over to the n-type side. So the holes, it's a positive charge moving over. So they're going to leave behind negative charges. And when the electrons moved over to the p-type side, those negative charges are going to leave behind these positive charges. And these are going to be immobile ions. These aren't going to be free anymore. And that sets up something called the depletion region because it's this region uh, between these vertical dash lines. That's where I, I was taking charge carriers from the n-type side and having them diffuse over to the p-type side and the, the, the opposite from the p-type side. Um, this region is now doesn't have any free carriers anymore because they diffused over to the other side. It's depleted of those free carriers, so it's called the depletion region. Okay, but when we make this depletion region, now we have a separation of charge uh, between two, two locations. So if I have a spatial separation of charge, what does that mean? What, what, what also is associated with that? Uh, capacitance, yes, capacitance is associated with that, and yes, an electric field. So, uh, yeah, both of those things. We'll look at both of those things. Let's look at the electric field first. Okay, so separation of charge means that there's an electric field across here, and uh, we draw the arrow from the positive side uh, towards the negative side. And we want to figure out what's this field strength, so we're going to make an approximation and say that uh, this depletion region is completely free of mobile charge carriers. I just gave you the definition that it was, but really there, there are some uh, mobile carriers that can be in the depletion region at any, any given point in time. There are just not very many. So we'll just say, we'll simplify it and we'll just say there's none. And we'll also say that uh, outside of this depletion region, there's no electric field. Again, that's a simplification, but it helps us with the math. 
Okay, so if we do that, then we can first look at uh, how many charges I have on each side uh, of this of this junction. So on the end side, I will have a certain charge density, and this charge these charges are positive, so that's why the charges are um, uh, if I multiply the charge density by the charge, it, it's going to be positive, and then um, on the the p side, those charges are negative, so that's why this is negative. Okay, and I'm going to say that goes to zero outside of the depletion region, and inside of the depletion region, it's a constant density on the inside, constant density on the p side. These two values don't need to be equal to each other, uh, but within the n side, it's constant. Within the p side, it's constant. Okay, then. Who's taken uh, 371? Okay, so we can apply uh, Gauss's law. If you don't haven't taken 371, don't worry about it. But we can we can use Gauss's law to then calculate the electric field because we know the car the charge uh, distribution. So uh, the derivative of the electric field is going to be equal to its charge density divided by the permittivity, and that's the permittivity of whatever semiconductor we're looking at. So if we set up uh, that differential equation to find the electric field, this looks like this. Uh, this is going to be a constant, and because of the, the approximations that we made earlier, like saying that the electric field is zero, outside of the depletion region, the second term go to zero because uh, this is going to be electric field outside of the depletion region, but we said that's zero. So that simplifies the math a bit and you will get uh, this relationship for electric field in the depletion region on the n-type side of the junction. And this equation for the electric field on the p-type side of the junction in the depletion region. So these are linear equations, and if we were to plot these, it's going to look like this. Um, so starting off on the top, this is the physical structure of the p-n junction, and that's p. Here's the charge distribution, and from the charge distribution, we use Gauss's law and get this electric field profile. So electric field as a linear dependence uh, upon distance in the depletion region, but it depends on which side of the junction you're on. Uh, and you can also calculate a, a maximum uh, electric field that occurs right at that physical edge between the N and P type materials. Um, that's given by this value. Okay, so, why is this important? Uh, these equations that, I, that I'm going over, uh, the derivation, you don't have to, to know. Um, I think for some of the calculations, you will need to calculate maybe this electric, the maximum of the electric field or something like that. Um, but really uh the point of this this is all covered in 324 so the point of this is not um you know to to really spend a lot of time on this but to look at how this electric field affects the current uh, through this diode so if i have this electric field it can give rise uh, to another current so we already have the diffusion current there because once we put the, the N and P type materials next to each other, we had charges diffusing. So we had a movement of charge, so we had a current. When we have this electric field here, um, we can also get another current, and that's called the drift current. Okay, so what will happen is if I have if I happen to have some free charges, um, in my uh, semiconductor outside of the depletion region. Once those free charges, if they're moving around 
and they enter that depletion region. They see the electric field, and of course an electric field produces a force on a charge. So that electric field will uh, push those particles or pull those particles through the depletion region and they'll end up on the other side of the junction. So once again you, had a, you have a movement of charge so you have another current. This is different from um, the diffusion current because it's, it's being driven by that electric field and in fact it's in the opposite direction. So the way that um, this current will work is that, uh, for example, in my n-type material, I don't have a lot of those positive charges, those holes, but they're still there. So if I had uh, that positive charge enter the, the depletion region, it'll move along with the electric field and it'll move across to the p-type side. So I have a, that charge movement. Same thing if I had a free electron in the p-type side. I don't have a lot of free electrons in the p-type side, but they still can exist. And if that free electron happens to get to the depletion region, the electric field will pull it across to the n-type side. So I have a movement of charge. So if I keep track of how these charges are moving, then that corresponds to a current from the n-type side to the p-type side. And this is the drift current. Um, this current, if you remember the direction of the diffusion current, the drift current is exactly opposite to that. And that makes sense because if I just have this p-n junction sitting by itself, I shouldn't be getting any net current out of it. Otherwise, I have this magic material that is, is always supplying current. So I've just solved all the, the energy problems uh, of the world. But it's not that simple. It, it, it shouldn't happen, right? You shouldn't have something just sitting there automatically uh, supplying you current. So the, the two currents cancel each other out in equilibrium if your PN junction is just sitting there. So it makes sense that they're in opposite direction. Okay, so summarize, here's our PN junction, that's the N side, that's the P side. Here's the depletion region with the electric field, and I have two currents. I have the drift current, and I have the diffusion current. They're equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, so they cancel each other out. And... I can draw the, the different directions of the, the different uh, charges moving through. So electrons are drifting. Oh, sorry, the, the drift current from the electrons is in this direction. The fusion current is in this direction. And uh, same contributions, same kind of contributions from the holes. Okay, so that's the currents that I have in the PN junction in equilibrium. Now let's go back to the fact that we have this, this separation of charge here. Okay, so we said that the separation of charge means that there's an electric field uh, and it means there's a capacitance. It actually means one more thing as well. What if I were to measure, uh, what if I were to put, or, or somehow measure the potential across this? Would that be zero? Separation of charge. I should have a voltage there, okay? And 
makes sense from the electric field too. Electric field, what's the units of electric field? Volts per meter. So if I have this electric field, I have some physical distance here, right, in meters. So I should have some voltage across that. Okay. So I have a voltage across this depletion region. That is given by this expression. Um, it is the it's the equilibrium voltage, so it's V naught. It's equal to something called the thermal voltage. Um, this is a temperature dependent value, and if we use room temperature, then it's about 25 millivolts. And the natural log of the this is the the acceptor. Uh, doping concentration. So this is the doping concentration on the p-type side. Nd is the doping concentration on the n-type side, and then the intrinsic uh, concentration. And if you do this calculation for silicon, and given um, typical doping concentrations for silicon, this comes out to somewhere around 0.7 volts for silicon at room temperature. Okay, so I have 0.7 volts uh, across that, that PN junction because of that separation of charges. Okay, so another question then is, did we, so we said we, we couldn't make this magical device with, with current automatically coming out of it, but do I automatically have, since I have voltage across this, does this also like creating a battery with this PN junction. So if I, here's my PN junction, if I just hook it up to a resistor, do I get current through that resistor because I have a voltage across that resistor? I give, so I'm giving you a, let's say in lab, I give you a diode and you just connect the resistor to it. You expect there to be power on that resistor. No, right? Okay, so we know, intuitively we know, no, this is not true. Now, the reason why it's not true uh, might not be, be clear, but we do have this voltage of 0.7 volts for, for silicon across the depletion region, but there's also going to be voltages. I need to somehow get the charges out of out of this p-n junction right so i'm going to make these metal contacts at, at, at the p-type side and put a wire there and make a metal contact at the n-type side put a wire there at these contacts we're also going to have potentials at those contacts so if i do a kvl around this loop it's going to be zero so Although I'm, I'm making 0.7 volts across this uh, depletion region, that voltage drop is counteracted by the voltage drops at these metal contacts. So I don't have a, a battery created by my diode. If you were to take your diode in equilibrium and measure the voltage across it in lab, it's going to be zero because the metal contacts uh, take up the, the voltage drop that's created by the PN junction. Okay. Um, and the final thing that I want to characterize here is going to be what the physical width is uh, of that depletion region. So, sorry, it's a little hard to see, but I'm saying that um, as you go from left to right, that corresponds to the x-axis in this physical structure. And so the edge of the depletion region on the n-type side is going to be negative xn. Right where the, the p and n materials meet, that will be x equals 0. And the edge of the depletion region on the p-type side will be x of p. So this is n. That's p. 
So here are just some different equations that you can use to solve for um, the value of xn, xp. And then the width of the depletion region will just be that distance uh, between xn and xp. So you can just add those up or use this equation and you'll get how wide that depletion region is. Okay, and then we'll look at this. We'll use this equation and a variant of it in order to then figure out what the capacitance uh, of that depletion region is. So we'll be using these equations uh, later on. But first, let's talk about... We've only talked about equilibrium. So the, the PN junction or your dial just sitting by itself. And that's not... Uh, very interesting because that's not how we're going to use it in circuits. Otherwise, you can't hook it up to anything. So, we talked about an equilibrium where we said there's a depletion region, there's a built in potential across that, that PN junction, across the depletion region, and we described all of that. But we want to know what happens when we apply voltages to the diodes. Okay, there's one. Uh, way that you can apply the voltage to the diode. So I can put a uh, more positive voltage um, at the cathode here and a negative voltage at the anode here. Or what you can say is that um, this side corresponds to the n-type side, so I'm putting the n-type side at a higher potential than the p-type side. And do you expect to get a lot of current in this case? No, it's, 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 if I had a current, it's going to be in that direction. So that's opposite to the, the arrow of the diode circuit symbol. So I'm not going to get a lot of current down through the diode. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to be able to change the capacitance uh, of that um, depletion region at the junction. Okay, so junction capacitance becomes an important feature uh, of the diode if I apply voltage of that polarity. If I apply a voltage of the other polarity, so the p-type size at the higher potential, my current wants to flow that way, and so I can get current to go through the diode. Therefore, I need to be able to predict what current I'll get as a function of, of voltage across this diode. And this is another way that you can operate diode. And we'll look at uh, both of these, uh, or all of these uh, operating regions um, for the diode. So let's look at this in a different way first. So in equilibrium, where we have no voltage applied to the diode, if we draw the current through the diode uh, as a function of voltage, so equilibrium is right at the origin, right? I am applying zero voltage across the diode, and I'm getting zero current through the diode. Now, reverse bias corresponds to a voltage in this polarity. But let's just stick with the polarity of forward bias uh, for now. So for this polarity, this corresponds to a positive voltage on this graph below. Okay, so for forward bias, what's going to happen is that my current through the diode will now exponentially increase as a function of voltage. So my diode current I is going to exponentially increase and this is dependent on the voltage across the diode. So that means reverse bias, I'm switching the polarity, so I can also just say that's a negative voltage. Okay, and in that case, 
um, I'm going to have a very small current flowing through the diode. And it's a negative current because my current is in the opposite direction. This, this I is in, the arrow is in the opposite direction of the, the forward bias case. Okay, so... This is a very small current. In fact, if, if we plotted it on this graph and I used an actual scale, it would just look like zero because the value of this current is going to be somewhere around a nanoamp or less. It depends on the dial. So very little current uh, going one way. That's why we can just to the, the first approximation, we can just say it's zero. And in the forward bias case, my current will very quickly increase as I increase the voltage across the dial because it's exponentially dependent. Okay, so let's go back to our, our physical picture and see what's happening. So, press reverse bias. Uh, if I'm reverse biasing, my positive voltage is going to be on which side of the junction? Um, this is N, this is P, so my positive voltage goes on the N-type or P-type side? N-type side. Okay, so I'm going to put my, my more positive side of the voltage source on the N-type side. That means my, my current should be going in this direction. And what's going to happen is if I have current in this direction, that corresponds to electrons uh, going in, in this direction in the material. Uh, and in the p-type side, the holes are positive charges going in this direction, as indicated by this arrow. So that means um, if I look at the depletion region, I'm, I'm pulling more electrons um, out of that, that area near the depletion region. I'm pulling more holes out of that area near the depletion region. So my depletion region is actually going to get a little bit wider um, because of this bias. So the width of my depletion region is going to increase. And I can describe that increase. So this looks really similar to the equation that I showed earlier for the width of the depletion region, except we just add that term VR there, which just tells you how much reverse bias voltage are you putting on this junction. But uh, this term, when you add this term, it's going to increase uh, what that width is going to be. So my depletion region width is going to get wider. And if my depletion region width gets wider, so I have a, a bigger distance between my, my separation of charges, that means I'm changing the capacitance that's associated with this junction. So let's see, I'm going to skip this slide. So if I look at the uh, capacitance uh, of the junction. This plot is showing how much charge we have in our depletion layer as a function of the reverse bias voltage. And if I want to find the capacitance at any given point, then I'm just taking the slope of this curve. That's one way to figure out what our capacitance is. Or another way is to go with our parallel plate capacitor equation. So what's the, what's the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor? C equals epsilon A over D, and that corresponds. Here's your parallel plate capacitor. So A is the area of the plate. And D is the separation between the two plates. 
Okay, so in our PM junction, where we have our depletion region, okay, so here's my depletion region. What is uh, D going to be? Where is the parallel plate capacitor here? Maybe that's, let me draw this better. Here's my n-type material, here's my p-type material. This is the depletion region on the n-type side. This is the depletion region on the p-type side. Doesn't that look like Here's my parallel plate capacitor. Let's fill this up with some dielectric. So doesn't this parallel plate capacitor, uh, my bad drawing, hopefully is not screwing you up, but doesn't that look like this PN junction? And so this depletion region where we have those mobile charges is like the charges building up on the plates of my parallel plate capacitor. So if I'm saying that this distance is D in that equation, then what is what is D in my what's the equivalent to D in my PN junction? The the width of the depletion region. So I said that that it we defined that as the width of the depletion region. So the width of the depletion region is going to be equivalent to D if we're analyzing our our PN junction like a parallel plate capacitor. And I have some uh, area cross sectional area associated with this material. So this is the A. Okay, so uh, for our um, PN junction, if we took our parallel plate capacitor equation and just adapt it for our PN junction, uh, epsilon s, because the permittivity we're looking at is the permittivity of the semiconductor um, area of the, the material, and the separation of charge is equal to the width of the depletion region. Okay, so we can also define this initial junction capacitance. This is uh, um, in terms of the depletion region width, but we can define it in terms of this is my equilibrium junction capacitance. So whatever that junction capacitance was with no voltage applied across my diode. And then if I divide by 1 plus the square root of my reverse bias voltage over the equilibrium voltage, then I can get whatever capacitance that would be. Um, so this is the equation for what this equilibrium capacitance is. Okay, so if I can control this reverse bias voltage, which I can because you're putting some external voltage across the diode, then I can control the capacitance uh, of, the, of the diode. So in other words, I have a, a voltage-controlled capacitor. My diode can be a voltage-controlled 
capacitor. And why would you want a voltage controlled capacitor? Well, here is an example. Um, if you want to create an AC signal, then you need something called an oscillator. So, for example, uh, your um, if if you make a like a microcontroller circuit, then uh, if you need an external clock for that circuit, you you have to have a, an oscillator there, like a crystal oscillator or something like that. Um, it provides a signal at a certain frequency. Um, if you have a communication circuit. Um, you want to transmit your signal at a certain frequency. You need an oscillator there to generate that frequency. Now let's say um, you want to uh, create that oscillator. One way to do it is with this, this kind of LC circuit. And we went over this in 211. If you have uh, this kind of circuit, then it's a uh, uh, an underdamped circuit and you get an oscillation. But if I can change say the capacitor value in this circuit, I can change the frequency that it oscillates at. What's the what's the equation for the frequency, the resonant frequency of this circuit? I'm sure you went over this in 213. And to eleven. Second order circuits, resonant frequency. Yes. So if I if I was doing it in, in uh, radio frequency, it's just one over square root of L C. But if I want to make it into frequency, then I, then I do the 1 over 2 pi. Okay, so if I can change either value, the inductor or the capacitor, but since we just talked about changing capacitance by applying voltage, we can change this capacitor if it's a diode. Then we can change the, the resonant frequency. So we can change the frequency at which this oscillator works. So you can have... Uh, various applications for this kind of things, but for example, when you uh, go to the lab and you use the function generator, you can program it to output you know a whole range of frequencies. So that's an example where you could use um, uh, a tunable capacitor so that you can change the frequency um, at the output. Um, if you want to use a, like a radio or something like that where you have to transmit at different frequencies and you need to be able to tune um, the output um, or the signal that you're receiving as well, then you can use um, this kind of oscillator so you can tune it at different frequencies. Okay, so you can do all of that using your reverse biased uh, PN junction or your reverse biased diode. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's go to forward bias then. Forward bias is a little bit more complicated because reverse bias, we didn't care about the current that was going through the diode. It was really, really small anyway, not useful to us. But forward bias, the current is going to increase very quickly as we apply the voltage across it. And so we want to know. How does that current vary um, with respect to voltage? But briefly, this is what's happening in the PN junction. So I'm going to apply a bias to this. And if it's for bias, uh, which side is going to be the positive potential? The, the P side is going to be the positive potential. So my current is going to flow through um, in this direction indicated by the arrow. That means my charge carriers 
uh, my holes are moving this way, my electrons are moving this way. So that corresponds to a decrease in the width of the depletion region. Um, let me skip that slide. So what happens is that uh, the diffusion current with forward bias uh, actually starts increasing because um, in the forward bias case, let me go back a slide, I have electrons moving this way and holes moving this way. So I have more electrons moving over to my p-type region than I had in equilibrium. I have more holes moving over to the n-type side than I did in equilibrium. So if I look at the, um, the carrier concentrations, I'm starting to get uh, an increase in those uh, what we call minority carriers because there's not as many holes in the electrons and uh, minority electrons because there's not as many electrons in the p-type side. So I start to get an increase in that and that means I need to have an increase in my diffusion current. So we need to look at uh, how those, the, those concentrations uh, of the minority carriers change and those, those carrier concentrations actually increase. Um, this graph is actually showing n-type side on the right side and p-type side on the left side. So it's, it's switched from what we've been looking at um, so far. But the important point is that if we look at um, how many are the minority carrier concentration on the n-type side at the edge of the depletion region, we start off with, with this equation. And then uh, from this equation, uh, we can break that up into quantities that we already know. And uh, an exponential dependence on distance um, in, the, in the junction. And this LP is going to be a diffusion length because um, your carriers have an associated diffusion length uh, with them. So that depends on their diffusion constant and their lifetime. Okay, so from this, we can use that to calculate uh, current densities. So from this, this top equation, you can then go to a, a current density with the second equation. And then uh, we can look at what the maximum current density is. That will be at a specific location in the junction. That will be right at the edge of the depletion region. Um, and that will be given by uh, this last equation on this slide here. I'm, I'm going through this really quickly because the derivation of this uh, is interesting, but it's not really the important thing. So, so the end result is what we're going to use. So we can also do the same kind of derivation for the, the current due to the electrons, the current density due to electrons. And um, these are current densities now, not current. That's why they're given by J. So if I want to figure out what the actual current is, I have to do the current density times the, the cross-sectional area of the junction. So here's my 3D PN junction, N type, P type, and I have some area A. That's what that A is. And then I'll get what the actual current is through this junction. Okay, so this is going to be my equation for the current through the PN junction, um, given my uh, applied voltage across the junction. So if we look at that current equation from the uh, previous slide, and then we make a substitution into there for this P sub N naught and N sub P naught, then we'll get uh, this equation on the third line. And then I'm going to make another substitution. So just call all of this stuff in this 
in this first part of the equation I sub s, which is saturation current. And then I can simplify this to be I equals I sub s, and I still have that same exponential term E to the V over VT minus 1. Minus 1 is not in the exponential. Okay, and this is going to be the equation that you use to figure out what the current will be through the diode uh, when it's forward bias. Okay, so here's my diode. Forward bias means the voltage is in that direction. So that's the voltage V in this equation. And that means that there's a current I flowing through your diode. That's this I. IS is usually going to be a quantity uh, that's given to you. And VT was that, that thermal voltage um, that we looked at before. So VT at room temperature is about 25 millivolts at room temperature. Okay, so if we go to the diode operating regions, again, this is just a review. So equilibrium, no voltage, no current, that's this point. Reverse bias, very small current through the diode. And forward bias will have an exponentially dependent current, um, exponentially dependent on voltage across the diode. And it's given by that equation, which is the same equation on the last slide. Okay, so on Friday we'll talk about, we'll start to talk about how to use diodes in some circuits.